Hello, everyone. Today, August 11th, 2016, we continue with the Osiri Corpus. If you haven't watched the first video, I suggest you do, or this won't make a whole lot of sense, because I'm not going to go over very much of it here. Um, but essentially, we're speaking of several things that come together. Uh, one is the are the beings that have been coming to us from other dimensions, realms that are related to us specifically in this context, uh, bridging the gap that began in May 29th on our linear time uh, when they were able to move through the portals that were being established or the connections that were being established through our already present portals, but new connections to um, the mother universe, as those calls it, the Atosic universe, the neutral universe, the mother universe. And uh, it is our mother universe, a, a long topic unto itself. But it supplies us with the mother's milk, and we have not had that connection open to us uh, since, um, well, a long time ago. I, I don't have an exact date on that, but a long time ago. So anyway, this is coming through to us again now. The whole reason why it hasn't been and all of that is addressed on, on the videos that I created on that. Then we have the um, Elixis Mundi light program that Asias Arising Project is working with, having to do with the Aeropax dynamic, which... Uh, connects portal it's a it's a real it's a portal creator is what it is but it's also a portal transfer uh, it, well i don't know you know it's a portal creator in the sense that if it's in in regard to if it is um what do i want to say activated by higher frequencies it becomes a portal maker uh, if it's not activated by those specific frequencies, it is nevertheless a generator to be uh, allow the individual or um, components of uh, sacred geometries to be inclusive, in, included into portals that have already been created. That's the best way I can put it briefly. It's kind of a high science there. So uh, there's a project that we're... I'm just beginning to work with here. I'm hoping others will pick up on it because I really can't do it myself. I'm just talking about it, basically. But um, to to create these aeropacks, these Isis I frequencies at locations that are already portals or ones that are very um, sensitive to that type of energy. Um, and in, in regard to why, well, it's forming uh, bridging synapses within the greater brain mind complex of the pyramidus radius matrix another another topic but the main matrix on our planet now that's inclusive of all is including all the matrices ah deep breath so then we have the more recent revelation to me about the isle of the mother sun which is in a sense the a, a little bubble uh, or a membrane that of of interdimensional quality that is is connected to Rapa Nui in the Pacific Ocean, the Easter Island, but is, it is not Rapa Nui. It's connected to it, sort of floats above it, you might say, or a little over to one side because I see it sort of floating just above the ocean waters. And it is not completely removed in dimension, but enough so that we basically can't see it, feel it, touch it, or smell it. But, however... It, we have the senses to be able to 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 reach into that flow and to be it, begin to perceive it. Like you know, people are seeing things now. Well, this is something they're going to start seeing on some levels. But that is just um, an you know a um, a phenomenal aspect of what it really is, and what it really is is a place that the ultra beings of our kindred light family. Are, have established within the pyramidus radius to begin a program that uh, of a higher nature that brings forth the embryo of ultra beings who are donating their embryo, you might say, to be seeded into human bodies. 
Um, but it's not along the lines of what have been done so far. And it is, it is on a higher level. It's the only way I can put it right now. The closest that comes to it was in the days when the, um, the companions of Horus and the ultra beings were on the planet. Um, they had something similar to that, but this is a, a little different even so. And I've already said too much because you can listen to my first video to get all of that. But it's more than just the embryo, the light embryo experience. It is a place where we can come in our dream bodies to not only perhaps involve ourselves in that particular embryo seeding program, if we wish, it's all according to our agreements and, and higher uh, accord, and in many cases conscious, but there's nothing interfering about it. This is all what we are part of in the greater picture. It's not bringing something into our field that we aren't a part of and trying to make it work. It's not that kind of a thing at all. That's what the Greys and the ETs are about, a lot of them. Not all of them, I shouldn't say ETs, because a lot of ETs are not. But um, some of them are. But this program, of course, is light engendered, and it is uh, a part of something that we uh, are all a part of. You know, we, have, we are not separate from it. They're just helping us to restore it. So that's all a preview of what's been. Now, I, I want to get into some new aspects of it. Persons can come in their light bodies, in their dream state. They will be coming. They will be drawn to, not, not yanked into, but drawn to, not, hip, not hypnotized into, but, but opened to uh, their own inner being saying, oh, yes, yes, I understand, I see, I know full clarity, full higher spiritual resonance draws one in. Nothing uh, abnormal about it. And when you are drawn into this state, into this island of the mother son, there are many things that can you can experience. One, as I said, is the celestial seeding program for specifically for certain women that are uh, ready for that. But there are other things. And one of the main things that I'm receiving also in this whole Osiris corpus, because we're still talking about the Osiris corpus, it's, it's the project that covers the whole thing, the embryo light seeding, but other aspects as well. And so what are these other aspects? Well, one of them that I feel is extremely prominent and an overall on this whole thing has to do with our building the proper Merkaba vehicle that will allow us to go through the Eshatan, the latter days, and be able to experience the division of worlds so that we are not encumbered by the persons who have chosen not to do that, are not locked away from it. They've simply chosen their souls. They've chosen not to become a part of it. And why would they not choose it? Because they have not, they're, they're wrapped up in their own uh, self-absorption. And we're going to get into that a little bit more in a moment. But those who have chosen need to be unencumbered by the stark presence of people coming undone, people disintegrating, people stewing in their own uh, stagnant juices, people you know, doing the things that are <laughs> even going on now on the planet that we find so distracting from our, our light body beingness. You know, it's it's difficult to stay aligned to that. I can speak for myself here, but, you know, with all of this other stuff going on. And that's not a weakness in it. It's a very strong magnetic draw. And um, the ultra beings are very compassionate to those of us who are struggling with that. You know, it's not a make wrong on us. And when we begin to work in the Isle of the Sun with the Osiri, I knew I'd have trouble with this, Osiri Corpus, Osiris, Osiri, 
Osiri, that's right, Osiri corpus, I've got it. All of these words, oh my God. They, you know, the irony, irony of it, and I've said this before, is that I would be dyslexic and have to deal with all these words and everything. But anyway, back to the Osiri corpus. It encompasses the whole program of light for really getting down to the nitty-gritty embodiment of the pure gem body, but not only that, of receiving the Merkaba that allows us to work unencumbered from distractions and from magnetic inf interference, from solar flares, from all of that inside the Merkaba. Don't think of it as a protective shield. I would prefer that term not to be used because, well, I say I, I'm encouraged to prefer that, <laughs> though to stress this, that, you know, when we talk about things of that nature, we're thinking, we tend to think in terms of, oh, there's something I've got to be protected from. I'm putting up barriers now. You can see me. I'm putting up barriers, you know, and it's not that we don't have protective things we can do. And, you know, I'm not putting that down, neither is those, but, but. We need to move to a higher level of understanding it because the minute we think we need to be protected in the sense of um, there's an enemy, there's a foe, and uh, we are a victim unless we put up protection. Now, there's some truth to that in the sense that we, have, we need to do things for ourselves to keep us whole and well and healthy. You know, uh, we protect ourselves from germs by eating healthy foods and washing our hands before we eat. You know, these are protections. So I'm not really trashing the word totally. But it's important to understand, I'm trying to move us all into this space, that there's something more, a greater understanding of what protection really is. And because the word's so associated with the other stuff, I kind of had to say that first. When we assume a macabic field, we are assuming something that is a natural part of our experience. And when we do that, then we are not bracing ourselves for the worst. We are not donning some armor that was made in a factory somewhere that's heavy and clunky but keeps the swords from penetrating our fleshy bodies. We are incorporating a natural function of wholeness. And when you incorporate a natural function of wholeness, well, yeah, it's protecting you from interference, but it's doing so in a natural way and not, you know, sharpening your blades and axes and putting up your walls. It's a completely different mindset, heart set, and thus heart resonance experience. So Thoth really wanted me to try to, to bring that home to you before we go any further with any of this. So I did the best I could with it in the moment. Um, so I'm going to just backtrack for just a moment here and say that I have owned for many, many years J.J. Hertog's Keys of Enoch. It's an incredible work, and I have not read it cover to cover. I use it only as a reference, and when Thoth or I am guided inwardly or whatever you want to call it, I go open it, and there is what I need. And it's usually a paragraph, a sentence, and it fits in directly with what I've been working with. And I find this very, very helpful. I don't do it a lot. Actually, I very rarely have in the last years uh, done that. Uh, I, I did initially some years before that, but not in the last 10, 15 years have I used it very much. And then um, recently I became aware of the Pista Sophia version. You know, the Pista Sophia is an ancient Gnostic text but uh, or Coptic text. Um, it says a Coptic text of Gnosis, okay. But I wanted the copy that is um, uh, is commentated on, I don't know if that's a word, commentary by J.J. Hertog and his wife Desiree. And I wanted that version. So um, I was gifted it, and I already wanted it, and I was planning to order it, and a dear friend just said, hey, I'll get it for you because it's kind of expensive. And so she did, and it finally arrived today. And uh, I was immediately requested by both intelligence to go to this book to help uh, to, to connect to it uh, in regard to what I was going to be speaking with you about today. Now, this is a big, thick book, but I was just guided, okay? And what I was guided to, one of the principal things is the symbolic shield of David. Now, this is within 
The Pistis Sophia, a Coptic text of Gnosis with commentary by J.J. and Desiree Hertog. And I will have links to all of this in where I embed this video. And so I opened it to the symbolic, well, just a page beyond, but then I read and turned the page, and there it was, to the symbolic shield of David. And this is very interesting because um, if you have read some of my previous material way back in the, well, not too far back, but in the 1990s, I write about how the Star of David configuration is what is the actual 4444 Stargate Merkaba that transports the world into the new Earth star. And in the center of that is the Isis I. The Areopax is the core in the center of the, um, the Star of David. Now, years ago, uh, again, well, not too long ago, probably 1997, and you know, I have this material written down. I cannot find it. And I looked and looked and looked for it. And I, I wasn't guided in that sense because I could not find it. However, I do have the image. It's called the Or Kabin. And Thoth requested that this be constructed. And a, another dear friend uh, uh, had them created for Simeon and I and herself. And we were working with this energy. Um, it helped us to, when we went on sacred journeys, which we were doing at the time, we performed grid installations uh, wearing this pendant. It has to do with, again, those dynamics of, of creating grids and, and formations of divine symmetry with the uh, ascension protocol. And you, I don't have a picture of the back of the medallion, but on the back there's fire letters that I received, and each one has slightly different fire letters for the individual that's wearing them. So I wanted you to see this pendant, or a kabin. So now this all fits into what I'm reading here in the, um, the book of the Pista Sophia commentary by the Hertogs. And let me see what part I want to read to you. Now, I'm quoting here from the book. We are now at a time in our scientific evolution when we are discovering the living, vibrating truth behind these ancient words and symbols that show us the significance of the Star of David and the Sword of Michael. Now, Michael is another thing. You know, Thoth has always said that he comes in hierarchically under Michael, who comes under Metatron. Um... We are living at a time of history so profound that it requires the rereading of God's word letter by letter to see the inner nuances and the sacred codings coming to life. Attempting to shorten all my reading of it, I'm going through some of this to say, here, as the vehicle of light grows in strength, it is able to separate itself emotionally and consciously from the lower state of chaos by means of a greater wisdom of light. And you see, that is exactly what I was being told. And I shared with all of you, even yesterday, I believe, when I made the other video, but it had been given to me previous to that. And um, actually, I think... I, I talked about it more on the uh, discourse with an um, interview that was given by Raven Sinclair and I. You know, she, she asked me questions. And that video, I believe that's where I was talking about this. And here it is in black and white. Okay. And she quotes from the book, from the Peace of Sophia, saying, And the word that your power has spoken, he will not fear the arrow that flies by day, means that Peace of Sophia was not afraid of the power sent last by self-willed out of the height and which entered the chaos like a flying arrow. Now, her talk goes back to the commentary now and says, We have now been given the means to win the battle. Yet we have also been given the wisdom to understand that at the culmination of the complete battle will be the ascension of the universe from the first 12 aeons and its sphere and firmament to the 13th aeon and on into the height whereby the old system is completely changed. This process will be connected with light objects flying like arrows which possess strong powers and special codes of control. There is so much in this. 
that you know I received so long ago and in, in about moving from the you know the what Thoth calls the world system one to the world system two see the old system is completely changed and he speaks of the of course we know biblically that the Maseroth is the 12th heaven and the 12 heaven houses and the Maseroth is the 13th I mean that I didn't receive that but Thoth speaks about it and says when we move from the one to the other just like this this is saying here just exactly um, So, then it says, this process will be connected with light objects flying like fiery arrows, which possess strong powers and special codes of control. Well, my goodness, we see those all the time on the, the videos that people are making of the, of the um, orbs, but also mainly the ones that are flying really fast. They go, you know, and they make a line of light. I, this is, I, I truly am seeing that this is what he's speaking about here. And it says, even in the day, these fallen light emanations can come to attack the soul. Yet these arrows bear the power of light geometries of the fallen ur light that is used to confuse the consciousness and destroy the heart in the interior of the human psyche that should be learning to break free of its containment, that should be learning to love and can, can and care for humanity even within the bonds of the lower consciousness. So... The arrows he's speaking of this process will be connected with the light objects flying like fire arrows and special codes and control. I believe that he's not speaking about the orbs, but the the arrows, the the fast flying objects. Uh, and I don't know that he means all of them that we see. You know, we have to be careful and not put everything in the same kettle. Because there's so much, there's so much diversity, not only in the world, but in the higher light beings as well. But some of these certainly fall into that place. Now, I'm not going to be going on with this particular right now, but I want to go back to mention again the, um, the Mstra molecule. And you've those of you following my work have heard me mention this a lot, and I have article on it and everything. I have lots of stuff on it. But, you know, essentially it is what those that we can call a lot of different things, but those of the lower vibrations, uh, off the beings from other worlds of the lower vibrations, uh, the magnetic lower vibrations, want in their bodies that we have and they don't. And they can't receive it through the means they're trying to receive it, and they have been for so long, they just don't seem to want to give up. And so on page 61 of the, the um, Peace of Sophia book, and I quote the commentary. The work of the Son of God is to restore human humanity to humanity, the true similitude, the original quality of light that was lost, which is the power to continue the divine image in its perfection into the myriad worlds of God. Now, Thoth would call this the inscription of light, or at least the inscription of light is the, the uh, access point, the fire letters of the quality of light that's called, being called here the true similitude. Um, But I, I find it amazing when I read this how correlative that is. In other words, the DNA-RNA spiral of energy within the body is coded from the divine image, but the biostratus was confused by the fallen lords of light, the fallen angels, so that humanity ceased to understand its higher I am identity and lost the qualities, the similitude of the light lost that higher spiritual destiny until it either had direct spiritual revelation through the Holy, Script, the Holy Spirit or in the abundance of wisdom was quickened by reattaching the human mind to the higher memory that existed before this world was. Now that would be, of course, the lotus what Thoth calls the lotus reality. Yet the image is within us. 
Perhaps this is why some extraterrestrial visitors appear to be interested in forms of body snatching or medical research. Are these beings part of the lower forces that cannot create themselves into the image of God, the Adam Kedmon, the primordial archetypal form of the Adamic race? There it is. That's exactly what Thoth has been telling me since, gosh, at least the early, at least 1991, probably before, and that is that these beings are grabbing us in the night and doing, you know, experiments and trying to get babies out of us and stuff because they're trying to create the Imstra molecule. And that Imstra molecule is what he's talking about here. Um, that cannot create themselves into the image of God. See, the, the, this is the, what has the, the codes for that creation. And, um, but they can't do it by experimental stuff like that. And you'd think that they get the idea. As I mentioned before, it's not, they don't think like we do, okay? And they're operating on many time frames at once. So to us, it's like, oh my, they've been after us for all this time, the Anunnakian and this and then that, and they never got it right. And why are they just keep trying? But you see, the ones that are coming to us now and in our now frame are coming to us simultaneously, eons ago, simultaneously in our future. It's hard to fathom, but that's kind of how it is. So it's not that they just keep going like the Energizer bunny, but that they're every place at once seeking out this formula. And they have ideas as to how it could be accomplished, and they have all the time in the world because they control the time factor in their logica, as those would call it. But let's don't go too far into all of that. The point is that, oh, there's so many points. Let me collect my brain here. Well, perhaps a little more reading is in order here. I'm going to page 62 of the same book, The Peace of Sophia by the Hertox. And the commentary reads, Christ goes on to explain further the mystery of human consciousness as something that cannot be encapsulated or identified as only existing within the categories or mixtures of this world. Our true nature is to be part of an unbroken light consciousness and continuum within the divine worlds. Ultimately, we cannot be permanently separated, divided, or pre predicated on our singular illusion of reality, since a portion of our higher self, the Adam Kadmon, is still connected with the Godhead, regardless of the fall or localization of planetary life. To awaken to our true identity requires the understanding of the many worlds before this world, as well as the forces that pres presently influence our consciousness mind. Then we will understand why Jesus himself had to come to activate the divine sonship from the world of the first mystery and why the vehicle called the Holy Spirit or the paraclete is required to energize this divine body for the marriage of the bride and bridegroom. And it goes on. This is a marvelous book. It's hard to stop reading, but I just want to make my points here and there with it. Um, so let me see. So we know that our kindred, as those calls them, are on many worlds and many dimensions. But who are our unkindred, those who are not? We would like to think all is one. We've been thought, taught in our spiritual concept to believe that all is one, you know, in the more or less New Age doctrine. So why is it that we have all this other stuff going on? Well, it may not be a simple answer, and then yet again it may if you have a brain that can simplify, which unfortunately I have problems with. Um, but we see it as a picture that's broader than just this universe. There are many universes, and their universes all began from the divine beingness, but some of them broke away and splintered. And I don't even begin, can't even begin to tell you why they did that. We're not going to discuss that right now. Even if I knew, it would probably be a topic that would take way long. So let's just say that happened. And these universes, like draws like. So the ones that were alike 
were drawn together and formed kindred associations. Well, our kindred is not just from this universe. There are other universes that have kindred associations with us. But speaking of our universe, we ha I, I, I lost track there. What I wanted to say was these universes originally had the energy of one form or another. But when they evolved, that is, moved through a, an experiential reality and created multiple realities, some universes of this nature, of the kindred, our kindred, such as our own, opened doors to receive the energies and the beings of the unkindred. And that is what has happened to our universe, and there are certain aspects of it that are fallen and can be identified in many constellations, even Orion, there's a, there could, because it's not a matter of place. It's a matter of energy. It's a matter of experience. So every system and star has an un unfallen aspect of it in that sense. However, the kindred on higher levels of experience in world system twos and beyond, they know how to, they have a natural ability to, to create a membrane that, you know, this Star of David thing, and probably a much broader experience of that, that allows them to be not involved with this infiltration. And Thoth has mentioned this infiltration as having uh, its, its um, opening uh, actually in, in Orion, where it was torn loose, and that's where the Eye of Ra is. It's not because Orion is a make bed. Orion is the seat of some of the highest powers in the whole, in our universe, in our hologram universe. It is the top dog. It is the place, the seat, where it all happens. And um, so the Eye of Ra, as Thoth calls it, is that um, at point that uh, connects everything to everything, and it was exposed. And when it was exposed, other pathways, pathogens, shall we say, could enter into this universe. Well, that's also where the highest seats of power are in Orion. So, um, you know, you have an interesting mix of things going on there. So when this tear occurred, it didn't mean that, the, that Orion was filled with negative entities. It simply meant that was where the tear occurred. And the whole universe experienced each on its level of receptivity these energies. And each on its level of receptivity drew in beings that equated to that energy that came from these other universal spheres. Which brings us to the arch archeons, I guess they're called, the archons, however it's pronounced. And it's a new term for me, actually. I've not heard about it for very long, and I was trying to look it up. And, and, and even in this book, it's mentioned, but very briefly. And um, trying to understand more about what the world sees it as. And they've equated it to negative ETs, to, to um, you know, they blamed archons with everything. It's like, you know... The archons did it. It wasn't me. The archons did it, <laughs> you know. But and and there is some truth to that in the sense that okay, this is how Thoth relates to the archonic energies. They were in an infiltration through the tear, through the eye of Ra, that set the frequency modality for all of these lesser infiltrations. And it is a magnetic dynamic that is oratronic in nature, half-light spectrum. It is like it's seeking its other half. And it has no brain to do it with. So it is pure law of attraction. To find the other half, and it doesn't even know what the other half is. Out of that 
energy cloud that we're going to call the Archonic Cloud, give it a name, evolves beings that live in that realm. Now, they can be intelligent, but only intelligent in the way that it serves the Archonic Cloud. And that's where we get these grays that are interfering and a lot of things. The, the Anunnaki, again, the Anunnaki, according to Thoth, there were some good guys in the Anunnaki. There was good and there was not so good. These were people. They weren't ar totally archonically controlled beings, no more than we are. I mean, look at us, you know. All of us have uh, a, a, sub, a part of us that can be influenced and pulled upon by the archonic cloud. And there's also cases of actual possession by the magnetic field becomes so strong that some of the archonic beings can actually possess bodies. Now, uh, to some extent. So why would they do this? Why do they want to mess with us? Why are they, are they just being, is it just for the heck of it? You know, that they just want to fool with us? No, of course not. It has to do with energy. And they are seeking their other half and they are seeking it through absorbing energy that will give them the power to do so. Or they think, they think, it's not a thinking thing, but it's a feeling thing. So when we have, if, if they can generate negativity in us, that, that energy, I shouldn't even say that. If the arconic cloud generates ne negativity in people, then it feeds off the negativity. But it's not planning it. It's not, well, let's think this up. Oh, I know, let's attack this guy over here. It's not a being. It's, well, in a way, it's more like a microbe. But uh, it has no thought processes as we understand it. It's impulsive. However, the beings that are subjugated to it, that have breathed it in completely, they have intelligence and wiliness and the ability to think how they want to do something. But they don't overthink it. It's a very simple plan. Now, I don't want to get into this a lot, but it really needs to be understood, at least I feel that it does, from the Thothic point of view. Because we also need to understand that when we shift frequency, we can completely eliminate it from our experience. That's what the ultra beings do. They live in this universe too, and they share a certain amount of our holographic field with us. Uh, they've expanded it, but, you know, it's, it's a similar projection in a way. I'm talking about our kindred now. But they don't have this problem, not on the level we do, and most of them don't have it at all because they are not in that vibration. You see, we're not victims of anything. We've allowed it all to happen on one level or another, but we didn't do it because we were nasty souls. We did it for other reasons, for, for reasons of not being aware, not being cognate, cognate, can't say that word. And that's a whole other path to take to understand why that is. But I'm trying to get back to our island in the sun. Believe it or not, that's where I'm trying to go with all of this. And so, the Osiri Corpus. It could have easily just as been easily called the Corpus Christi, body of Christ, but that, that serves for a, a, a larger picture than we want to focus on, so I think that's why Thoth called it the Osiris body or the Osiri uh, Corpus. It is about bringing back the parts of Osiris's body and reassembling them with Isis's help. We're all Osiris. We all had the body parts spread out all over the place, and we're bringing. We're needing to bring them back. And the Os Osiri is Osiris and Isis and Horus working as a threesome teamsome, and maybe throw in Nephilim as well, in, in regard to the artification of all of these energies coming forth and um, helping to resurrect us because we cannot ascend until we resurrect first. Remember, Jesus resurrected and then he ascended. <laughs> so we have to bring those parts back together again. And we need to be, they need to help us and to be able to work with us in an area that is sealed. 
and it's sealed by the Orkabin, or a version of that, the higher light vehicle, Star of David, whatever you want to call it. And so this island of the mother's son is sealed within that. It's also sealed that nothing can get in unless it re relates completely to that vibration and nothing can be tapped and used inside it. Now you could say, oh, well, anything of the higher th spiritual, that's true with it all. Well, yes, it is. But you see, the difference is, is that this, this island of the mother's son, is not in an entirely different dimension. They have to have it positioned on the threshold, on the event horizon of our reality so that they can work with us in a way that equates a far more physical experience for us. And yet, they can do so without contamination of the project. And the only way they can do that is to put us in a, a bubble that is still part of our environment, our world experience, not environment, but our world experience, but has a, a subliminal environment that has, is, is totally light infused at the same time. So by placing it inside the pyramid radius matrix that is forming, I shouldn't even say, it's continually forming, but the platform is already formed. And the same thing with the many things that I'm speaking about here. But anyway, so if they have it in that field and it's just barely skimming the surface of our beingness, then when we move into that field with our, with our light bodies during dream time or uh, awake visions or willed experience or whatever, we're actually tapping into something far more immediate to our physical cellular being than, um, you know, moving into some hyperspace beautiful spiritual reality or even new earth star experience because that's beyond all of that. So the Osiri corpus incorporates working with us to help us develop our Merkaba light vehicles to the level that they will encapsulate us so that we can work on our pure gem bodies without interference. Prior to this, we've been doing a lot of work on all of these things, and I've been reporting it, and others have too, in their own language. But it's being interfered with from this magnetic spectrum, and it's a very narrow bandwidth. We could just put one toe outside of it so easily, but we don't because it's, our feet are so heavy. <laughs> it's so magnetic. It's hard to lift a finger, you know, and if we could, we could be out of it in a second. Well, unfortunately, they can't just snap their fingers and let us all do that, but they can do this, what they're doing for us now, and this allows us to create the body, the, the, um, the Merkaba that we need in order to work less impaired by these other forces, depending upon how strong we build that Merkaba. It's like the old saying, you can give a person a fish to eat and then they're hungry the next day, but you teach them how to fish and they're never hungry. Well, it's kind of along those lines. Maybe I'm uh, stretching it a bit, but, you know, they are teaching us how to do these things so that we can do them for ourselves because that's where it's at. And so now I'm going to go back, excuse me, so now I'm going to go back to the Beast of Sophia and the commentary on the, by the Hertogs. In the ancient Egyptian scriptures, Osiris was the great forefather who worked through his triple power expression of Osiris, Isis, and Horus in connection with his quad quadrinity messenger, Thoth, also called Hermes the threefold. Just as the divine God works through his trinity powers and unfoldments of thereof, so 
also the local sovereigns work through a trinity power. And, you know, Thoth has the three dots on the forehead that, that he accented, but underneath it there was actually birthmarks that marked those spots, but they weren't as clearly defined. But he would wear, a, you know, a, 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 I don't know if they were little, like, painted dots or what over them and, and um, to accent them. Not because he was showing it off, but because this was a, a salutation of the energies he possessed. And, you know, when you're dealing with beings who have in total light engendered control of their ego, not control isn't the right word, acceptance of their ego, they can proclaim who they are. And they have no, no problem with that because their energy field is so, so explicit. And they're not proclaiming it out of, look at me, see who I am, but out of the divine word that forms and creates manifestation out of their internal event horizon that keeps recapitulating with divine beingness. Boy, that was a mouthful. I didn't say that, folks. <laughs> really, when I get to talking that way, it's coming from another place. And so anyway, now I'm talking because I'm stuttering. Um, so to continue reading here. Ju um, so this is out of the piece of Sophia itself. And the mystery of their whole region and the mystery of all their invisible ones and all of those who are in the 13th aeon and the name of the 12 aeons and all of their archons, rulers, and all of their archangels and all their angels and all those who are in the 12 aeons and the whole mystery of names and all those who are in the Hirimini, oh, I can't say that, I'm sorry, H-E-I-R-M-A-R-M-E-N-E -E -E, and, and in all the heavens. Wow. So back to the commentary. Jesus is saying that there is indeed a hierarchy of spiritual personal personalities that controls creation through the names of vibrations and the thought forms. Through discrete instruction, these create the physical world of flesh and blood as we know it, as well as myriad worlds of visible and invisible intelligences of which we are not aware. But many of these realms of the cosmos, including that of humanity, are still within the half-life function of 12, the Oratronic, i.e. within the sixth aeon or principle working according to a limited light scenario. Again, Oratronic, half-light spectrum. All 13 aeons function according to a limited schematic of evolutionary growth. For the Gnostics, there were not only realms of chaos and the 12 lower aeons, but the 13th aeon within the region of the left, which still required salvation and which still existed above and which existed above the 12 aeons and above the region of the fate and the rulers of chaos. But the 13th aeon was below the emanations of light, the region of the right, and the region of the midst. Yes, this would correlate a great deal with what... I have received about the, that. Um, the goal then in the restoration of our local universe is to restore all 13 aeons and establish an interchangeability between the left and the right. Thus, whether we look towards the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 aeons, the 12 gates in the heavenly Jerusalem, they will require the intercession of one from the higher dimensions above the 13th to create a quantum change. The 13th represents the threshold and an order of magnitude that must be crossed by those who have mastered the realities of each of the first 12 aeons and have graduated out of their respective systems to become the higher heavenly tribes. And it goes on and on. Now, I have not actually received anything that I'm aware of. I might have done so and I've forgotten it by now because, you know, we're talking about a lot of material back there. But that has spoken about the intercession coming through the 13th into the 12th. However, perhaps I have and I didn't know, realize it because years ago I was... Uh, when I was first introduced to Metatron, it was the Metatronic being that established these frequencies and light veils. And that being was holding a path open for us. Uh, and it came down into our experiential space, although many of us could not receive it because we don't have our controls in order, you know, to be able to do so. So that 
might relate. I'm not sure, but it could relate to what is being said there. But I find this extremely helpful to understand that, that whole principle. My intention, my intention is always to make these so much shorter. And I just keep going because there's so much that needs to be connected, one thought to the next to the next, to get where I wish to bring all of you in this context. And if I was a great orator, I could probably do it in a lot less time. But unfortunately, I am not. Um, so where have we come to in conclusion to this particular video? To see that the Osiri corpus is a divine project of light from the higher beingness, whatever you want to call it, from the metatronic realm, that is helping us in many ways to facilitate the corpus, the body, to bring, to bring our uh, resurrection so that we can then have our ascension. And in order to do that, at least the two things that have been revealed to me so far in this project, and there are probably more to come here, is the uh, embryo light seeding, which is addressed on the first video, and the uh, developing of the, uh, and I, I want to call it or kabin, which is the same thing that this medallion was called. So I'm going to, because I, I've, I'm getting that, that's acceptable to use that term. You know, there's so many terms we can use because this particular medallion was directed to work with the grid installations, but not only in the, on the land, but in the bodies. So I'm going to call it the Orca Bin, the Orca Bin or Star of David configuration that contains within it the aeropax. So here's where the Elixis Mundi comes into play. But we're creating it within ourselves. And this field will allow us to work relatively undisturbed by the, the magnetic energies of the uh, archaeonic clouds and their minions, its minions. And so in order to do that, they're bringing us into a field that is, can be interpenetrated by us and them and the higher light realm, but can remain uncontaminated by the archons or the Arconic Cloud. So these are the things that are coming up at this point. And we'll see where else this takes us. So I believe I'm going to conclude here for now. And until next time, many blessings to all of you.